Well, look, I was I was genuinely shocked to to see what was going on because, uh, in fact, bizarrely, you'll, you 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 might appreciate this. I was at um, an event in uh, Cambridge, and we were talking about polarization. We we're talking about populism, and and people were asking me. Did I see any parts of the world where I felt that politics felt like it was kind of, you know, working for people? And I talked about one or two countries around the world, but I also mentioned Ireland in the context of the fact that you and Leo Varadkar had this kind of arrangement that was driven by the election, the election and the, the vote of the people at the last election. And I sort of gave that as a as a as evidence of. A, you know, a kind of fairly mature and stable approach to politics. And literally, I get out, I get out from the event, I get in the car, I look at my phone, and there's, you know, breaking news riots in Dublin. And I think, what the hell is this about? Welcome to the latest episode of my po- podcast. Uh, my name is Michal Martin, Tornishta, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence and leader of Fianna Fáil. And I'm delighted to be joined by a special guest today. He's a journalist, uh, he's an author, um, strategist, broadcaster, activist, podcaster, but perhaps famously uh, and most well known for his role uh, with Labour Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair as his spokesperson, press press secretary, director of communications, director of strategy, uh, and a lot, lot more. His most recent book is called But What Can I Do? And it looks at the rise of populism and polarization in politics and how to address that. And he currently co-hosts uh, the very, very popular podcast, The Rest is Politics, with former cabinet minister Rory Stewart, uh, which, um, is, 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 as I said, uh, one of the most go to podcasts, uh, particularly for those involved in politics and, 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 and societal issues. Delighted to have you here, Alistair, uh, to chat with me. My Could pleasure. I first perhaps just said you you you're, you're aware in 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 the last e- last evening, uh, and yesterday we had um, uh, some terrible incidents uh, in in Dublin, in particular the an appalling and horrific attack on um, three young children and their carer, um, and but for the intervention of a, a Deliveroo um, worker, uh, it could have been far worse, and um, that was followed by um, a lot of rioting. Um, and the organization in a very rapid way through social media platforms, uh, crowds onto the streets and um, rioters and people who looted, who attacked on Garda Sikana. Um, and in many ways, I was reflecting on your work and particularly your most recent book, But What Can I Do? Um, in terms of the growth of populism, of polarization, and the nature of public discourse, because if you read any of the social media platforms arising out of yesterday's events, you see this hate of the other, hate of the foreigner, uh, and this sort of focus on the political establishment being responsible for the kind of uh, society we have today, and real hate and bile manifesting itself uh, in those messages. And I would just perhaps, given what you've written and reflected on this, your your thoughts on on this. Well, look, I was... I was genuinely shocked to to see what was going on because, uh, in fact, bizarrely, you'll, you, you you might appreciate this. I was at um, an event in uh, Cambridge, and we were talking about polarization. We we're talking about populism, and and people were asking me, "Did I see any parts of the world where I felt that politics felt like it was kind of, you know, working for people?" And I talked about one or two countries around the world, but I also mentioned Ireland in the context of the fact that you and Leo Varadkar had this kind of arrangement that was driven by the election the election and the, the vote of the people at the last election. And I sort of gave that as a as a as evidence of a you know a kind of fairly mature and stable approach to politics. And literally I get out I get out from the event, I get in the car, I look at my phone and there's, you know, breaking news riots in Dublin. And I think, what the hell is this about? And I guess my initial reaction was it was, I don't know, it was a bit of a sort of flashback to the, you know, peace process stuff. And I thought, oh, my God, is this something really, really bad? And then, you know, as the facts emerged and I guess because I maybe have a bit of a romantic, slightly romantic view of Ireland. Um, most of my experience of Ireland has been either 
in the work that we did during the build up to the yeah. Good Friday Agreement and beyond, or as a tourist, or in recent years coming over and speaking at events and you know doing media and book tours and that sort of thing. And it's always been an incredibly positive experience for me. And I've never had that that sense of this kind of hard right. Uh, and it was interesting listening to the the police chief talking about the situation, absolutely calling them out. Um, and I've never really had that sense of, of of its existence within your within your society. So that came as a as a big shock. But I think the thing the thing that I think relates to the the things that I've been writing about in the book and and talking about on the podcast and wrestling with more generally is that we are now in this world where if you combine the disenchantment that a lot of people have with their own lives the desire to find people to blame for that be that politicians be that immigrants be that anybody that they can say is not one of us allied to the speed at which rumor can fly conspiracies can fly and it's very 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 hard to contain when it kicks off um, and if you just think about the last week in politics, you know, that guy in Argentina, Millet, who's just been elected, I think it's almost impossible to think that in the pre-Trump, pre-Brexit era, era, somebody like him would have ever got elected to a major office of state in one of the big Latin American countries. And then literally a few days later, you have Wilders winning in, in Holland, Holland, a country that we would think of as you know, broadly liberal, broadly centrist, always one of the kind of sensible guys at the European table that you know so well. Um, so I think what it signals, all of these things signal, is that we haven't got on top of this populist polarizing virus. Um, and we've got to find ways of, of addressing the issues. But at the same time, we've got to find ways of restoring people's sense of at least a, a minimum, a modicum of trust in institutions, of trust in politicians that get to the top. Um, and, you, you know, you're seeing in different parts of the world now this, this the extent to which the police are becoming a target. Yeah. Now, in some countries, that's always been the case. But, you know, I think it, it's we, we see I've, I've got friends over here who work in the police who work in the fire service, work in the ambulance service. You know, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, you just didn't imagine that fire workers and ambulance workers had to worry about being attacked when they went out to do their job. And yet now they do. Absolutely. And mm. so there's something deeper going on. And I think it's, I think it's a political question. I think it's a societal question. And I think there's a lot of this is about education as well. I think that we've, we've lost the educative piece about politics. We've lost the educative piece about our, our responsibilities as, as citizens. And we've got to get it back. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, I would agree with that. I would say very quickly, to, in, in some respects, obviously, what happened last night isn't reflective of the broad mass of the Irish people. No, exactly. I think the migration issue is a back is clearly there in the ether, and and uh, globally, it's a global phenomenon, and uh, you can see how Russia weaponizes it and other states weaponize mm. it. Um, but then, you know, I had a very heartwarming experience before I came to this podcast. I was just with about fifty odd citizens from Gaza dual Irish citizens that we managed to evacuate from Gaza. And I spoke to them. I spoke to one man who lost his wife, brother, and mother, but got his two kids out. Can you imagine? But he said something to me that kind of, in the midst of all of this, uh, gave hope because he said, can I just thank the people I've met here? He said, the, the warmth of the people around me, the neighbors. I mm. couldn't, I've never met nicer people. The civil servant that stayed with me for the last month, we call him Patrick, who's been with me on the phone guiding me through to get my kids out of Gaza uh, because he had happened to be able to, uh, he was in Saudi Arabia at the time in business. Mm. Uh, so look, th that, that is still there. And I was reflecting myself last evening, you know, we have a modern, progressive, inclusive society in Ireland, but it's worth fighting for and it's worth fighting yeah. to protect. I mean, we had high, high moments when the uh, marriage equality referendum was passed. What was striking about that was the numbers of young people uh, that flew back um, who had been working in UK or across Europe to definitively vote for marriage equality uh, mm. and likewise repeal for the AIDS. It was a very strong young movement and it was very mm. activist on those issues. They're not equally as activist perhaps on the political front 
uh, in terms of the norms of party politics as we might have experienced them. And um, yet, yet you have made a fair point in the preface to your book, What Can I Do?, uh, that very often many young people are drawn to uh, the strong man syndrome in, in politics or in power, be it Bolsonaro, be it Trump, uh, um, or be it others. Um, and uh, there's that sort of paradox um, in, in, in terms of where young people are. And you spoke about the educative piece. I think that is very necessary in terms of how do we reintroduce politics to, to young people. Um, mm. In, in well, I mean, underpinning the fundamental values of, of yeah. the political system as we would have known. I mean, I don't know what, what the situation is in, in your education system, but in, in here at the moment, if you're in school, you might learn a little bit about kings and queens and all that stuff. But unless you decide to do politics at A-level, you know, 16 to 18, then you won't do politics in school. You won't learn about politics in school. I read something last week, you were talking there about meeting dual citizens from uh, Palestine. The, the 2% of our schools teach anything about the Middle history of the Middle East. So you have now um, this sort of sudden, well, it's not sudden, but in terms of the October 7th attack, this conflagration that has kind of consumed millions and billions of people around the world and really divided people and made people angry and emotional and so forth. But actually, if you talk to people about the, their actual knowledge of the history of this, it's very skin deep. Yes. And we had a guest, we had a guest on the podcast this morning, a guy called Tony Clug, who's a, a very interesting guy because he's he's been on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian divide in terms of the advising and negotiating, and he's one of those kind of genuine experts. And he says he's sometimes appalled at at the level of ignorance, including of like senior politicians, because they've grown up without this institutional memory of, of where this thing all, all came from. So I think we've got to get back to a place where people can be educated about politics and also where we can try to, to build a bit more respect for the people who go into it, because that's the other problem yes. at the moment. You know, mm -hmm. the, the amount of um, this event I was at in Cambridge, there were mainly students and I asked them if any of them had ever thought about going into politics. Now, about five said they might think of being an MP sometime. And about 20 said they could think about going into politics in different ways other than being an elected representative. But I'm pretty sure that five, 10, 15, 20 years in an audience of that size of students at one of the world's top universities, you'd have had a hell of a lot more people saying they might think about it. And I think that's we're just narrowing and narrowing the gene pool of people who go into it. And a lot of it is partly because of the abuse that you guys get, because of the particularly women and, and particularly women yes. of color around the world. Um, and also, and I think the professionalization of the work. What I mean by that, you know, we, we educate financier, financiers, um, engineers, um, very often very remunerative. Uh, potential lifestyles for individuals as they come out of college um, and the idea of a political career now is anathema to many yeah and the whole idea of like we're kind of growing up if, if I may say so a sort of a nerdy political <laughs> sort of cohort as opposed to the broad experiences of life and very often yeah. I mean you get focused oh that person can't have two jobs you know <laughs> as if if you're a lawyer or if you're an engineer you shouldn't actually be in politics you know yeah uh, whereas we want the experiences of life I, I think anyway, um, yeah. involved in shaping yeah. policy and shaping legislation, and um, and that that's a big negative. And uh, and you're correct that the the abuse, the social media stuff, not everybody's cut out for it, you know. Um, mm. So so in our system, and I, I think what you're saying, and and to all of those who developed the curriculum in Ireland, and I f this is a long running battle of my own, is to preserve history at second level as a core curriculum. I mean history in the broadest sense, not just yeah, about yeah. kings and queens, but about politics and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and there have been attempts to take it out of the core curriculum at what For we sure. call junior certificate level, which mm. I do not understand, particularly given the history of Ireland, British-Irish relations, etc., um, and our European membership. So I think we do have to have that generalist approach to political study and, and, and the basic mm. principles of how society is put together, the social contract, yeah. um, and, and, and history itself, the evolution of, of, of the world and, 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 and your own country. 
Um, and I think then politics itself as well in terms of core subject in terms of, okay, I don't mind people specializing in politics and so on. I think that can be a good thing. Yeah. In terms of your own um, career, Al Alistair, um, you could have been a politician yourself. You, you didn't opt to go into the public realm in the sense of being a political representative going for election. Did you think about it? And um, I did. I did. And I, in a bizarre sort of way, I still do. Uh, but I'm 66 now and the kind of world has moved on a bit. And I guess that in doing all the different things I do now, including the podcast, actually, you know, you can you can stay engaged in the political debate without necessarily being a politician. But it's very weird how my how life kind of works out. Um, so when I was a journalist and John Smith was leader of the Labour Party, um, I actually was starting to think about whether I'd kind of a bit done with journalism and I was starting to think about, I was very close to Neil Kinnock uh, and I was starting to think about maybe what about, you know, possibly going to get, uh, become a politician. And John Smith died. Tony Blair became the leader of the Labour Party. He asked me to work for him. I initially said no, um, but then I did that job. And funnily enough, is the, the great thing about, I don't know if you keep a diary, Mio, but the great thing about keeping a diary is that you can remind yourself of things that you've completely forgotten. And not long before the 1997 election, Tony Blair said to me, why don't you get a seat? And I said, why? You're worried you're not going to have any the people you need when you get in and he said no I just think it might be you know good idea we're going to need good MPs blah 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 and I said well do you want me to run the campaign or not he said oh yeah you've got a point you can't do both can you no okay do the campaign then 2001 I sort of said listen because at that but you know as time went on people like David Miliband Ed Miliband yeah. Ed Bulls Pat McFadden James Pennell and all lots of the people around us and the special advisors team were we're getting seats. And I said, look, why don't I get a seat? And he said, no, 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 you've got to do the campaign. Then 2005, I left in 2003. I'll be honest, I was sick to death of it. Uh, and so 2005, I went back to help Tony on the campaign, but I didn't, it's the, the minute it was over, I got on a plane to New Zealand and went on the British and Irish Lions tour. Um, and then 2010 with Gordon, Gordon tried to get both me and my partner Fiona to stand. And there was something holding me back. And to be absolutely honest, I think the whole the thing that was holding me back was um, two things, really. One, sort of that feeling that I really genuinely think there needs to be another generation coming on now. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was I just about got my life back together again, having almost lost it again. Um, and so... We, you know, I, I, I do know I'll always regret it. Um, and I once said that on French television, bizarrely. I, I, I was being interviewed about a book on, I'd written on French television. And the, this woman said, you know, similar to you, why have you never stood in your own right? And I said, well, you know, here's the reasons, but I know I'll go to my grave regretting that I never did. And I'll do my first impressive name drop of the day the footballer David Ginola phoned me up and I'd known him a bit because we played together in a few charity matches. And he said, he said, Alistair, if you know you will regret something, it means you have to do the thing you will regret if you don't do it. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but that's, I said, that's fine. But what if I know that I'll regret it if I do it as well? <laughs> and that's, that's what these difficult sort of rock and a hard place choices are, aren't they? Because yeah, I could have I could have done it. Um, I, I regret the fact that I didn't, but I also feel deep down, I'm not convinced that I would have been happy doing it. But also, it's fair to say that the role you had really was at the heart of decision making, strategizing, yeah. reacting to events, crises, strategizing in terms of policy issues, where you should move and so on like that. So in a way, you are in politics with significant influence albeit the elected representatives ultimately have to make the decision and yeah. at a period and in a movement that irrespective of people's views any person involved in politics stands back and admires the enormous success of of, of, of that new labor yeah. call it experiment or or uh, in, in political terms and winning majorities mm -hmm. turning it around 
uh, and then developing a whole range of, of, of political um, initiatives at the time. And I must say, from an, an Irish perspective, the relationship between that new Labour part, uh, government and Irish governments just went up a level. Oh, yeah. Um, that, to a certain extent, hasn't been repeated, you know, but no. uh, it just went up a level in terms of trust, in terms of uh, heads up on everything and working mm. together genuinely and learning and sharing experiences and so on. It was a very, very warm yeah. uh, relationship no, that did I impact positively, I would argue, on lies on, 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 on across these islands. Yeah, I, but and, and, you know, you know as well as anybody that these, when you get to that sort of your level in politics, these relationships matter. Absolutely. And the fact that Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn got on so well, but also, interestingly, I, I, when we had Jerry Adams on the podcast not long ago, he was absolutely clear that the arrival of Tony Blair was the big thing that, that moved the dial for them. They felt yeah. there was trust, or there was the possibility of trust. And so I, I, and I think you're right. I mean, it saddens me that I get the feeling, and I know you have to be very, very diplomatic because it's his job, but I, it saddens me the extent to which in the Brexit debate, Northern Ireland was not even considered in the consequences of the Brexit debate, ditto. And there's a sort of, there's an arrogance about, I think, about the current government in its attitudes to, to Ireland that, that they used to be when I was a journalist. I can remember I can remember when Mrs. Thatcher was Prime Minister and Charlie Hockey was Taoiseach. You know, there was an arrogance. There was a sort of, there was an attitude towards the Irish that was, that was really quite, quite sort of repellent. Um, and that went. And I, I think a little bit has come back again. Yep. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the extent to which particularly during the Brexit negotiations, because, you know, as you know, I go to Ireland a fair bit, the extent to which stuff was happening that had a direct impact upon you guys, and I don't think it even figured in their thinking a lot of the time. No, I don't think... A, which, was a, yeah, which gave rise to all the issues around protocols and uh, where we are today. And also, you've written the bit I've always uh, been taken back by was the absence of any really due diligence over the impact on SMEs, um, yeah. small businesses, supply chains, people who were sending stuff to Ireland, exporting to Ireland on an ongoing basis. Well, I, I Maybe was sorting the material in third party, uh, you know, or th th third countries now suddenly have tariffs, now suddenly are ringing their friends in Ireland saying, listen, I can't do it anymore. It's not working out for me. So yeah. there's a huge imposition on a lot of ordinary small to medium sized businesses. Uh, well, that, I, I, that was I don't think it was factored in. Just to give you an example of that, I was the last time I was in Dublin last week, I was at an event hosted by and post, and they were just explained to me in raw hard numbers the impact that there was because of the post Brexit arrangements on customs and on form filling and all that stuff, the extent to which small and medium enterprises had literally just stopped bothering to try to send stuff to the UK. And vice versa. Yes, yes. Now, at least you've still got the ability to go into the European single market. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. The rest of the the rest of the single market, we've lost that. So, no, I th I think the um, I think the attitudes to Ireland have, have have definitely taken a step back since those days. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I think uh, Prime Minister Sunak has brought a degree of professionalism to to the thing, but still, it's uh, you know. I, I was in both periods. Um, I was education minister when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. Uh, and the first s series of North South Ministerial Council meetings, the British Irish Council meetings, th there was a tremendous sort of um, warmth and, 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 and mm. engagement. Um, and they, they were very heady days, but I think they had impact. And I, I remember in my first stint as foreign affairs working with Gordon Brown and mm. being struck by the degree of detail that he was, as a British Prime Minister and time, that he gave to the whole issue of devolution of policing and justice mm. with Sean Woodward. And uh, I mean, very often it was they were ringing me. <laughs> Sean Woodward would say, I want to uh, meet you in Cork. I, I, uh, we need to get this thing moving and so on like that. And again, mm. the executive was up and down at the, at the, at the time. So, yeah. uh, you know, it was a, it was a very uh, impactful sort of uh, engagement uh, and a genuine uh, interest in, in, in how things would, would, would develop. 
And could I, I mean, there's a very good play uh, on the agreement, on the Good Friday Agreement. And I saw, I don't know whether you saw it or not. I, I did see it. Oh, did I did you? see yeah, it. I'm hoping to see it. Um, I think it's in the Lyric again uh, in, yeah. in April. So I, I saw 30 minutes. They did a quick performance for us when, when we had all our ambassadors back to Dublin recently. It was a great line because I'd heard this in the talks on justice that uh, about Tony saying, you know, I'll write you a letter <laughs> sort of thing. And I was in the talks and I don't know who said to me that they have more letters from Tony Blair in the <laughs> top drawer. <laughs> so, I know, there was, there, so was, there was. I was going to ask you if you, you can answer that about the letter <coughs> writing, but also what's your standout moment on the Good Friday Agreement? I mean, the side letters were, I think that that's we, I can't remember who originally used the phrase in the context of the, online, of the Good Friday Agreement, this thing about constructive ambiguity but there was a lot of constructive ambiguity in, in the different side letters that were that were going here and there i think oh, standout moment i think of the time itself it was when we got to the helicopter or the plane we got a helicopter to the plane and we were flying back and if you remember tony blair's family were in spain on a holiday with jose maria asna <laughs> And I remember, remember Tony said, "Oh God, what's my mother-in-law going to be saying to Asna before I get there?" And he, um, but as we got into the, just going up the steps of the plane, and there was a Jonathan Powell took a phone call and he passed the phone to Tony and said, um, "Oh, it's the palace. The Queen wants to have a word." Now I don't remember that ever happening at any other time. Wow. in terms of being out on the road and unexpectedly getting a phone call like that. And I'm not a sort of big monarchist by any manner of means, but it was just that was, that was a moment where, I, you know, because you know what it's like when you're going through this kind of all-night sessions and yep. all the rest of it. Yeah. You get to the end of it and think, thank God that's over and on you go. But I think that was the thing that dropped into my head. God, that was... It kind of sunk in bit, then, yeah. yeah. This yeah. is something massive going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there were lots of others. I mean, you know, I can some of the... Some of the black humour. Um, I remember who was it said. Oh, it was actually it was Bertie Hearn who said, you know, if uh, he was talking about somebody else involved in that, he said, if I kill him, will I get out in two years? It was like there was a lot of kind of yeah, yeah. Black, and, and 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 I was I was really pleased. I went to see the play. Um, it's a very 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 good. Um, it's a good play. It does capture something of the what of was going the, on, yeah, yeah, and something of the characters, the as, characters well. as well. Characters as well, yeah. yeah. Mm. Can I ask you a question that's out of sync with what, what we've just been discussing? It's um, it's always been something I've been interested in in terms of personalities. Uh, I served with David Miliband uh, around the European Union Council when he was Foreign Affairs Minister back in that two um, oh seven to two eleven period. Very impressed with him. I found him a great guy to work with. Mm. Uh, there's always a big question mark in my head was he a, the great prime minister that never was in many respects because uh, uh, I thought he was a powerful articulate um, politician um, mm. who really was um, to me a person who almost was destined for that job but maybe the timing was wrong or whatever I just don't know that's a yeah I mean look I, a lot of I get if I had a pound for every time somebody stops me in the street and says do you think you, less so now because you know yeah Time. Maybe we moved on a bit, but, you know, did Labour pick the wrong Miliband? And, of course, there was a sort of kind of quasi-Shakespearean element to the two brothers thing and all that. But these, you know, th there's no doubt David is a... I think he's actually still quite a formidable political operator. This international charity that he runs, and he made a speech the other day, which, um, which he sent me, which was, you know, really kind of big, rounded argument about some of the big themes happening in the world. Um, and, I mean, who the, the, the honest answer is, who knows? Who knows? Um, I do sometimes wonder if he'd been leader of the Labour Party against Cameron, might he have beaten Cameron? If he'd have beaten Cameron, there'd have been no referendum. If there'd been no referendum, there'd be no Brexit. If there'd been no Brexit, would Trump have sort of, you know, managed to do what he did? And you can go on forever like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's to his credit, though, David, that he's he's obviously decided. You know, he's kind of he's out of UK politics, and as, as things stand. But at the same time, he's continuing public service in a different sort of way. Yeah, I mean, I didn't 
in many ways asked a question in, in juxtaposition to Ed in some respects because I think they're both very talented. Yeah. Uh, people. In fact, the whole the, the, the history of the Milliband family is an, a, absolutely a, quite an inspirational one. Yeah. Uh, Post war yeah. and so on. I think they've made a very distinguished contribution to public life yeah. and public. Um, but discourse. but as you but as as you know, you have to, you know, to become Taoiseach, to become Prime Minister, you have to be leader of your party, and and yep. uh, you know David didn't D David didn't make it, and I and I think it's interesting how often, uh, you know, I, I mentioned sort of the thing that changed my life when John Smith died. If you just said to most people the day before that, the day before John died, if you just said to most people, probably including myself, if John Smith dropped dead tomorrow, who do you think the next leader? Most people would have said Gordon Brown. Yeah. But then when it came to it, the party reached a different conclusion. Likewise, I think most people, as you say, would have assumed that, you know, post Gordon Brown, probably David Miliband turned out to be Ed. I don't think many people would have said post Ed Jeremy Corbyn, but that happened as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Timing, fate, um, opportunity, you know. Um, yeah. And, and, and that has a huge role, yeah. role to play in politics. And Absolutely. I keep saying to younger people or people interested in politics when you're looking for candidates and they'll say, look, maybe not this time, the next time. And I'd say they may not be a next time. Yeah. They've got to seize the moment in, in, in politics. Um, and I, you see, I, th I think the, right. your question to me about, there's obviously something in me that has held me back from doing it. Because I remember Tony once saying, somebody had come to see him and said, uh, wanted to have a chat and say, yeah, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about whether it might be a good thing for you to become an MP. And Tony's, he's quite sort of, quite blunt. He said, well, look, if you're thinking about whether it's a good idea, yeah. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because it means, you, you know, you, you don't have hunger. Yeah. You don't have, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. I, when I yeah. look for candidates, I look for hunger. Yeah. I just look for yeah. hunger. Someone who's determined to win that yeah. seat. And in our situation, yeah. it's probably even more competitive in that Absolutely. we don't have safe seats. Yeah. In the sense that traditionally in, in, in UK politics, there was a Labour heartland or a Tory heartland, less yeah. so maybe now in some George areas. But nonetheless, you could sort of identify oh, yeah. a candidate for a seat and you had a very good chance of becoming um, an MP. Whereas in Ireland, it's multi-seat proportional oh, representation. You've got to have that mm. personal sort of commitment hunger to mm. win the seat and, and all that that, that entails. And yeah. I'm, I'm struck because when you said you, you, you something was holding you back, I would have said maybe as a strategist for such a long time, um, you'd, you were probably mentally and everything else exhausted at the end of all of that. Because I can only imagine, you know, I've been at the heart of the UK government, the international role, the, the war in Iraq, all of that uh, takes its toll. Uh, politics takes its toll mm -hmm. um, on one's personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, w there are times when you're on a treadmill and you're wondering when, when will I ever get off the treadmill. And you, you have spoken very honestly about mental health and about depression. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you've done, it's been an important public contribution, public service contribution to put that out there because I think we're still on that journey of destigmatization of, of, yeah. of mental health and, and depression. Um, and I think you, you've written about this, how you've, the journey you've been on in terms of, 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 of um, improving mental health, restoring mental health. Could you talk to me a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, of all the stuff I do, I've probably had as much um sense of fulfillment out of that as anything else i've done since since kind of leaving full time full on uh working inside politics um i still think we've got a long way to go in fact i i really worry that we're going forward in the right direction in terms of awareness and understanding but certainly in the in britain i think we're going backwards in terms of services and and that's a real problem um, but I just, I, I just, you know, I, I had um, a pretty ba bad breakdown in my 80s. Uh, I also had a brother I was very close to, I had schizophrenia. Um, I had a, another relative who took his own life. I've had, you know, quite a lot of mental challenges sort of, you know, in the, in the family. And I just think that one of the problems with this is that we... Th is so shrouded in this kind of stigma and taboo and that makes it even worse for people who are, who are struggling yeah. um, and I think if we can break the stigma and break the taboo we can start to then improve the level of debate within the political space about what good mental health services might might look like um, and so and, and I also think in terms of you know I, I talked about David Miliband still making a difference I, I still try to make a difference in different ways and 
this is an area where I just felt that the kind of particular skills and interests I have in relation to communication, in relation to strategy, in relation to that sort of relation, the relationship between uh, messaging and policy. I think this is an area where I really believe if, if we can change the nature of the debate around mental health, we'll actually improve people's mental health. Absolutely. Um, okay. And ultimately, I think a preventive mental health strategy would end up saving countries very, very, very large sums of money. Yeah, we're, we're developing now mental well-being initiatives yeah. in schools um, yeah. and sort of emotional well-being uh, in schools, but developing a national well-being framework as a new yeah. benchmark to decide how we're progressing as a society. It's a bit processy, if you know what I'm saying, lots of, which kind of worries me a bit. I think we have to make it more tangible to people in terms of that. Yeah, well, you need, you need but both, don't you? You, yeah. need the kind of, you need the vision thing and you need yeah. the processy stuff. Yeah, and I, I just get, and I'd be interested in your thoughts uh, on this in terms of, because I would have been a minister for health. I, I've met many survivors, if you use that phrase, of the services, to put it that way. And very often many have a negative view of the professional and or the clinical mm. side of mental health. Um, the psychological side less well developed in some respects and then the whole idea of non-governmental organizations community-based organizations mm. where people mm. can meet and engage and um, in many ways it got compartmentalized to the professional area although that's very important I don't want people to yeah uh, understate the importance of the professional treatment and so on but um, historically that perhaps didn't facilitate society as a whole dealing mm. with, with, with the issue of mental well-being and I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of potential there. I, I, as someone who's experienced this, is that your sense or what would you, how would you recommend to us or to, 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 to people in general uh, as to how this issue should be de dealt with? Well, I didn't know you were doing the thing in, in schools because, because that is where I would start. I think one of the things I'm pleased about that Labour Party are proposing is actually these mental health hubs within schools. Um, but I, I, I think we'd, we, need to, we need to think about what... Uh, a preventive mental health strategy would look like and what what it to me would mean is that we focus on our mental health as opposed to thinking that we need a service where when we get be, when we when we develop mental illness we might if we're lucky get access to some kind of treatment and so that that means to me that for example i think social prescribing is something that uh, we, we should continue to develop. One of the best things I ever saw in a mental health event, Matt Hancock, when he was the health secretary under Theresa May, he, he, he organised this event. Um, I can't remember if, if the Irish government was there. I'm sure they would have been. It was like government ministers from around the world came. The one thing that stuck with me from the whole event was the health minister from Zimbabwe, who basically stood up and said, you know, it's interesting to hear all this stuff, but, you know, we haven't got much money. Uh, so we have to do kind of different sort of things. And he, and he talked about this scheme where they had something in every village and every community called a friendship bench where a local woman, usually a woman, would basically just sit there all day and people wouldn't necessarily even know that she had this role, but they'd go and talk to her and they'd pour out their problems. And she would then know where there was a local music group, where there was a local walking group, where there was somewhere where you could actually go and if need be, see somebody that might be able to help you. Now, I think that that kind of idea set in the community context with voluntary organizations, these are the sorts of things that I mean that government can kind of set a framework and then we can, we can actually allow communities to do much more of the heavy lifting that at the moment we, feel that government should be doing. And I've noticed, for example, that post the financial crisis, uh, and I have to say, I've done stuff with the Bank of Ireland before, who've got really done some interesting stuff on this, but virtually all of the banks, all of the big banks had to deal with suicide during the global financial crisis. Mm. A lot of them did. Bank, I know the bank, the stock exchange did as well. And so, that's, I think, given them a better understanding of what happens if you don't take care of people when they're under pressure. Um, and I've noticed 
the the banks deservedly a lot of the time get a very bad rep but i've noticed when i've gone and done events with these banks there is a deeper understanding i think of this more preventive approach than there is within government and okay. so i think that the encouraging schools encouraging communities encouraging businesses encouraging families as well to understand that there's a you know there's more there's there's an awful lot we can do for ourselves that we haven't necessarily been doing and that's a big part of a preventive approach yeah and i think that's what we need to do is to unleash that potential in ourselves and people and communities uh, uh, yeah and so on i mean i i've got no doubt at all i cost the national health service a lot less than i used to because of lifestyle choices that i've made yeah. for myself i go i was swimming in the 40 foot the other day was over i, I heard cold yeah. <laughs> yeah i swim in cold water every day yeah. uh i i work out i keep fit i try to sleep uh responsibly and you know i know when i'm and in relation to diet and all these kind of simple things which i just think we well certainly i for most of my life i did not take seriously enough and since i've taken them seriously my physical health has been better i still get bad asthma i still get too many chest infections and i still get depression but i i get it less than i did and i know better how to deal with it and it doesn't always involve me going to see a doctor it involves me knowing having developed the mechanisms and the strategies that i can use to help myself through it i couldn't agree more i think swimming in the sea for me is the um, the ultimate therapy and getting the head Brilliant. under the water and uh walking uh and keeping in touch with nature uh and um uh, i don't follow burnley but i uh, man united well right if you look at the league, connection you know <laughs> i know but if you look at if you look at the league table right now we held that's that's not that's not a great one listen could i just finally say to you um rory stewart and 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 and, and the podcast and so on uh, to me he's a loss to politics in the context but for what can i do when I, when he resigned i kind of said oh what a loss to, to the political world mm. um, and an awful pity he didn't keep going. You obviously have developed a strong relationship with him. Um, just your quick thoughts on, 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 on Rory himself and how you've kind of bonded in the context of the podcast. Well, the, po the podcast itself has been a bit of an accident. I mean, it's actually a, a fellow Burnley fan who works for Gary Lineker's company, who a guy called Tony Pastor, he came to see me and said, look, we do this very successful podcast, The Rest is History. We think you should do one called the rest is parties, but probably with a Tory. And I said, I don't really like Tories, Tony, you know that. I spent most of my life trying to sort of destroy them. And anyway, but I thought about it, and, and, and maybe this is me just getting a bit old, but I thought, well, maybe there is a place for me doing something a bit less tribal, a bit more kind of, you know. And so I, I couldn't think of who to approach. So I, this is some of the benefits of social media. I did an Instagram live and I did a Twitter thing saying, if I did a podcast with the Tory, who do you reckon? And I reckon way ahead of anybody else, Rory Stewart came up. So that was interesting. So I gave him a ring. We, we did a pilot the next week and we started the week after. We've done every week since. And it's been at number one in the UK charts virtually every week. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think what I've, funny enough, we did a charity event last night and, um, it's interesting because we're very, very different. We really are very different sort of people, different backgrounds, different polities, different politics, different interests. And yet, I think we've been able to develop a, 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 a mutual respect and, and a kind of camaraderie that I think people, it wasn't planned like this, but I think it's one of the reasons now why a lot of people like listening to it. We've only actually had one um, really kind of bad fallout in the podcast. As it happened, it was about Northern Ireland. Um, and I was probably in a bad mood anyway. But it, And it was very, very interesting how many people got really upset. Like, you know, because they, 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 they thought they'd the found this... was not, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they found this oasis where two people who thought differently about things could actually agree about quite a lot. And they could listen to each other respectfully. So, and I think that, listen, I think it's great you're doing a podcast. I think more politicians should do their own podcast. I really do. Well, I think uh, we've got I, to, it's a bit where you, you, you've been coming from in terms of your advocacy around politics and people getting involved and let's end polarization. You've got you to combat this. We've got to yeah. and engage with the new media, basically. 
Absolutely. Uh, podcasting is one of those um, um, uh, forms. And I, I think yeah. you use something very interesting. You've got to do something less tribal. And in many ways, that's a positive, too, that we all have to c come out of our sort of zones, if you like, safe zones. And well, I, th I think I think what's, uh, what turns a lot of people off politics, and it's different for you because you, you as I say, have got this this coalition going on where you can't just be tearing lumps off each other the whole time. But I think a lot of people for our politics, and particularly with this, honestly, I've been quite mild about the state of our politics and, and the current government. It's like, you know, I barely, I barely watch the news anymore because I know what the stories are going to be. I know what they're going to say. I'm fed up with the lying and the gaslighting. I'm fed up with these ridiculous interviews that they do where they don't say anything. And if that's me, who's kind of fascinated in politics and always has been, yeah. what's it like for kind of somebody who's not that interested? They're not even watching or listening to this nonsense a lot of the time. So you have to go out to them. You can't blame them. You've got to go out to them in a different way. And I keep saying to our politicians, look, the, the, you, it's amazing. You get these politicians who say, oh, I'm really enjoying your podcast. Oh, I really listen to it every week. And, you know, any chance I could come on and blah, blah, blah. And I say, look, rather than that, why do you think about why – Ask yourself the question, why are people wanting to listen to us in a way that they're not wanting to listen to you? And, you know, there ought to be a few pennies dropping that people are sick of the way politics is presented to them. They actually, you, you still have got the remnants of a, a proper serious media, I think. I still yeah. think you've got some proper we newspapers, have, yeah, yeah. you know. But we, we don't really. I mean, when you saw the, the autumn statement the other day, and literally the Times, which used to be the newspaper of record, so-called, Hunt eases tax burden because of one big national insurance, when the tax burden's, you know, highest it's been since 1949. Um, it's like, we. so I think people are look, looking to us. They sort of, they don't see us as politicians, even though we've both been in politics. They don't see us as media, even though we've both been in media in different ways. But I think they're coming to us in a way because they don't like what the politics and media that, that is defined as politics and media is doing. So I, my, my message on that is look, try and adapt a bit, which is clearly what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And also, though, I think the popularity of the podcast reflects, but what can I do? It also reflects a yearning for a lot of people out there for the center ground, I use that phrase, or for space where people can discuss I mean, I mean there is an antipathy among a lot of people to the polarization that you get on social media uh, a lot and, and, and oh. sort of tribal stuff so what your that podcast in many ways reflects a yearning for can we have people thinking through issues giving mm. different perspectives argu argu arguing and debating and so on like that mm. listen mm. Alice it's been fantastic talking to you we really appreciate you. your time. No, uh, at all. Continued and um, good health, and we're looking forward to further insights from you on the affairs of the world and indeed the United Kingdom as well and uh, British Irish relations. Thanks. Listen, it's great, great to see you. All the best. Take care. Take care. Yeah, yeah.